Tonight, unprecedented and unrelenting. Reinforcements coming as Canada's wildfire season intensifies. Fighting new flare-ups in Nova Scotia. We're literally in a battle for our lives and for our properties. And a staggering scope of destruction across the country. That's over five million football fields. A rare and dangerous rescue. <laughs> the Sherpa, who saved a climber from the Mount Everest death zone. Plus, rocketing into history. It is something that is so magnificent. The first indigenous woman in space and her inspiring journey. CTV National News with Omar Sachadina. Good evening, everyone. Domestic and international assistance is being deployed tonight to battle simultaneous fires raging right across this country. So much territory has burned nationwide. It represents an area five times the size of Prince Edward Island. By the end of the weekend, about 100 members of the Canadian military are expected to be on the ground in Nova Scotia. A hundred American firefighters are also coming to Atlantic Canada over the next few days. The destination for another 200 from South Africa is TVA. It's the latest massive and coordinated fight during what has already been a record-breaking fire season. We'll get to that in just a moment, but we begin with CTV's Atlantic Bureau Chief Chris Najkate at the epicenter of Canada's fire threat. The smoke from the largest fire in Nova Scotia's history could be seen from New York and Boston as the fires in Shelburne County rage on. We're literally in a battle for our lives and for our properties and, and for our homes. The latest evacuation order prompted patients to be moved from Roseway Hospital while others grabbed what they could. Pictures, my valuable jewelry that means sentimental value and that's it. As water bombers fly overhead, the now more than 5,000 evacuees in this region can only watch and wonder if their home will be left standing. I'm afraid we may not have our house. It makes you feel sick. The wildfires northwest of Halifax are 50% contained but still out of control as the mercury shot up to plus 32. It's hot and it's hard work and I can tell you they're working very hard on numerous flare-ups. This mother of four lost her home of eight years after fleeing the fires in Tantallon on Sunday. Literally two of my children left with no shoes on their feet. Their friends are providing this house for now while strangers drop off essential items for them to begin to start over. It is all adding up to make like a huge impact on people like my family. Twelve additional fires broke out in Halifax, including one at this century-old athletic club. Halifax's mayor said one person was recently reported burning leaves with a propane torch and another had a bonfire. This is a clear violation of the no stupid policy if ever there is one. And I think everybody can understand that. Don't do it. Nova Scotia's premier repeated his calls for urgent help to Ottawa, remembering the bureaucratic red tape they experienced after Hurricane Fiona. I would urge them to, to, to act on those and, and uh, be, be proactive on even what, what hasn't been requested. While today saw record-setting heat, some relief is on the way. Rain from the north is expected to be here Friday evening, with much more on the weekend. Omar. And that's what they desperately need, Crease, and thanks. To give you a sense of just how dire things are, consider that the area that has already burned across Canada is 10 times the average by this time of year. And as CTV's Ottawa Bureau Chief Joyce Napier reports, that's causing alarm. Saskatchewan, Alberta, B.C., wildfires are raging in seven provinces and one territory tonight, an unprecedented warm season that has scientists worried. Across the world and by almost any metric that we look at, wildfires are growing worse. They are burning larger areas, they're burning more severely. These shots captured by satellite show wildfires started burning in early May. We have just started the season, and if this is the opening act, then boy, we're going to be uh, into a, a very uh, a very hot and flamey kind of, um, of a of summer uh, uh, ahead. Record heat, gusty winds, monster flames reaching 100 meters. 
Extreme and long-lasting heat caused by climate change draws more and more moisture out of the ground and vegetation, resulting in conditions ripe for wildfires. It is a simple fact that Canada is experiencing the impacts of climate change, including more frequent and more extreme wildfires. Canadians are seeing and feeling firsthand, uh, firsthand the effects of these fires. More than 200 wildfires are burning across the country, almost half of them out of control. So far this year, and approximately 2.7 million hectares have burned. To put it that in some context, that's over 5 million football fields. So far, almost 30,000 people were forced from their homes, 5,000 of those in remote communities. But as some are allowed to return to assess the damage, Omar, others are facing the anguish of fleeing the fires. Not in the clear. All right, Joyce, thanks. NDP leader Jagmeet Singh had strong words for the man a majority of lawmakers voted to be removed as the special rapporteur on foreign interference. In a statement, Singh called David Johnston's insistence on staying tone deaf. CTV's Kevin Gallagher is here now with today's testimony from the Prime Minister's point person on national security who admitted there were failures. Kevin. Omar, the testimony revealed the communications breakdown resulted in several top officials not learning of allegations China targeted Conservative MP Michael Chong and his family. Today, National Security and Intelligence Advisor Jody Thomas told the committee she first learned about this in the Globe and Mail earlier this month, despite being sent the original CSIS memo in July 2021. You were Deputy Minister. I was. Yeah. I was on leave in July 21. Uh, when it was sent to my office and when I got back, I focused on Afghanistan. It was not who, put in front of so me. So who did it go to in your office? No one. It was identified. went into a black hole. Right. Former Public Safety Minister Bill Blair was also supposed to receive the memo. Today, he blamed the CSIS director for deciding he didn't need to know. Thomas insists she's made changes to stop important intelligence from falling through the cracks, Omar. All right, Kevin, thank you. Air raid alerts went out across Kyiv tonight. This comes after Russia launched 20 strikes on Ukrainian cities last month. One blast today left three people dead and led to accusations the nearest bomb shelter was locked. CTV's chief international correspondent Paul Workman has this report with some images that are hard to watch. A grandfather lost in a blur of sorrow and anguish, the body of his nine-year-old grandchild at his feet. Killed by debris from a rocket in the panic of yet another Russian aerial attack. Running with her mother and others to an underground shelter, pounding on the doors to get in, dying together on the ground outside. The third victim was this man's wife of 17 years. The entrance was closed, he said. There were maybe five or ten women and children waiting outside. They knocked loudly, but nobody came. I ran for help, and then it happened. Ukraine said Russia fired 10 ballistic and cruise missiles at Kyiv, continuing a punishing month-long barrage. The death of a nine-year-old felt especially heartbreaking and barbarous on this of all days. To be killed in a Russian missile attack on International Day for Protection of Children, also observed in Russia. This woman and her five-year-old son live near the shelter. Where are you scared, she asks. Yes. Did you cry? Yes. And what did you say to mommy? That we're going to die. Just hours before today's attack, Ukraine's president told the country that 483 children had been killed since the beginning of Russia's invasion with one more name to be added to that horrific count, Omar. Just a staggering and heartbreaking toll. Paul Workman in London tonight. Back here at home, one of Canada's largest energy companies revealed it will slash 1,500 jobs. Suncor, which has its headquarters in Calgary, says the cuts will take place before the end of the year. There is no end to the misery for patients who suffer from long COVID and tonight, a new study is confirming what many Canadians already knew about the virus's lasting impact. CTV's Heather Wright explains. Like most Canadians, Susie Golding has had COVID-19. She caught the virus in 2020, but she still lives with it every single day. My memory is poor now and 
my speech suffers. Golding is one of the millions of people living with long COVID, persistent symptoms that linger long after the infection is over and can include fatigue, brain fog, and depression. I have recovered to a certain point and I'm able to, you know, I'm able to uh, see I'm searching for words now. Researchers have been trying to determine what causes these neurological and psychiatric symptoms and why they last for months and even years. Does that feel good? A new study by the Center for Addiction and Mental Health sheds some light on how the virus affects the brain. We found that there was inflammation in the brains of people with long COVID and it was particularly in areas of the brain that are important for the ability to enjoy things, the ability to have motivation to do things. Dr. Jeffrey Meyer led the study, which included positron emission tomography, or PET scans, on the brains of 20 participants, Go. as well as a finger tapping exercise. He says confirming inflammation is vital to developing effective treatments, as right now there are few options for those suffering. We have to have better solutions available to people with long COVID that we can say with conviction are particularly useful. For people like Susie Golding, who founded the Long Haulers Online Support Group, these results are validation. It's concrete evidence that there is, in fact, something going on. And it's also a reality check that a lot more funding needs to go into long COVID. One of the next steps for CAMH researchers is to look into whether existing anti-inflammatory medication might be helpful for those living with long COVID. Omar. All right, Heather, thank you. Air Canada says it has diagnosed another technical glitch in its network that delayed more than half of its flights today ahead of a busy summer travel season. The latest problem was with the airline's communication system used to stay in touch with its fleet. That same system was impacted by an outage a week ago. Pride Month celebrations kick off today, but in over 60 countries, being part of the LGBTQ2S plus community is a crime. And just this week, an international outcry over Uganda's strict new anti-gay law, which includes the death penalty. CTV's Vanessa Lee on the roadblocks on the journey of inclusion. Outside this Ontario high school, signs of defiance. Parents and students are proudly waving pride flags, despite their school board voting not to. Just because we go to a Catholic school doesn't mean that we stand behind what the board has voted for. We want to tell everybody that everybody is safe here no matter what they look like. For companies taking a stand, the stakes are high. Target has pulled some products that celebrate Pride Month off store shelves, citing threats to employees. The work of this transgender designer is no longer on display. I think that it's a very dangerous precedent to set that if people just get riled up enough about the products that you're selling, that you can completely distance yourself from the LGBT community when and if it's convenient. Target's decision came after Nike and Bud Light faced backlash over their partnership with transgender influencer Dylan Mulvaney. This month I celebrated my day 365 of womanhood. And Bud the move Light sparked a firestorm of hate ever. and criticism and from conservative and politicians and celebrities who called for a boycott. Bud Light sales dropped nearly 30%. The parent company plans to triple its marketing spending this summer. There's a lot of beer drinkers that uh, just don't share the kind of opinion and the point of view that was being put forward in the marketing. With a rise in backlash and attacks against the community, there are urgent calls to make spaces safer and more inclusive. Specifically to the youth across Canada, even globally, I want them to know that they're not alone and our community is the strongest that it's ever been. With Pride events taking place across the country over the coming weeks and months, organizers say security is top of mind as they seek funding and support. Vanessa Lee, CTV News, Montreal. Coming up after the break. Just this isn't happening today. <laughs> foiling a robbery attempt at a family-owned business. Plus... It has been dangerous. He's been hit by boats multiple times. Tracking a beluga whale believed to be a Russian spy. The heroic actions of a Sherpa guide in Nepal are being credited for saving the life of a climber on Mount Everest. CTV's Tom Walters on the daring high-altitude rescue. 30-year-old Gelja Sherpa carries the weight of life and death on his back. Over icy and treacherous terrain, he does what few have ever done. Save a stricken climber 
from the grasp of the so-called death zone near the top of Mount Everest. It took me five or six hours. It was very difficult, he says. Gelja had been guiding a Chinese expedition whose members abandoned their own quest to rescue a Malaysian climber they found clinging to a rope and shivering. Left like that, he could have died, Gelja says. We saved his life by quitting the summit. The man had to be carried from an area climbers call the balcony to a point 600 meters lower on the mountain where he could be picked up by helicopter. But Gilja Sherpa is no stranger to saving lives. Last year, pulled from the ground by helicopter, he rescued this climber and another the same way. But many have not been so fortunate. This year, at least 12 people, including Vancouver doctor Peter Swart, have died in the thin air of Mount Everest. The brain doesn't get enough oxygen, so you get confused. Uh, you get incredibly just, uh, just tired. Of course, the fact that it is so difficult for any one person to go up the mountain is what makes it so extraordinary to see two come down. Tom Walters, CTV News, Los Angeles. Incredible footage and story of survival. And a pair of shoplifters met their match at a family-run hardware store in Ontario when they tried to run off with thousands of dollars worth of tools. I went over and asked if they needed any help looking for anything. They said no, they were just browsing, and next thing I know, they were running. <laughs> Staff jumped into action, chasing two men out of the store and surrounding their vehicle. One employee even stepping in front of the getaway car. Honestly, nothing really was going through my head. It was just, stop this. <laughs> they didn't get far. They lost control of the vehicle and crashed. Five men were arrested. Still ahead, reaching for the stars. Checking in with the first Indigenous woman in space after her historic mission. This is the start of National Indigenous History Month, and we are kicking it off with someone who just returned from a historic journey to space. On tonight's Indigenous Circle, CTV's Donna Sound speaks with an inspiring astronaut. The SpaceX Crew Dragon spacecraft lifted off last October. And inside was Nicole Mann, the first Indigenous woman from NASA to go to space four and a half times the force of gravity uh, through your chest. It just throws you forward. And we said, wait, we made it. We're actually here. And then, yeah, you know, everybody starts to cheer. She conducted two spacewalks, totaling 14 hours, installing upgrades to the space station. You're looking at our planet that has every human that's alive on it, you know, except for the ones that are in our spacecraft. Man spent 157 days in orbit traveling distances so fast most of us couldn't imagine 17,500 miles an hour every 90 minutes you're making you're making a lap so you get about every 45 minutes you get a sunrise and a sunset among the challenges the lack of gravity you open that bag everything starts to float away the first native american woman to live and stay aboard the international space station Man is a member of the Round Valley Indian Wallachie tribe in California. And I have it floating uh, next to my crew quarters. A dream catcher helps her sleep on Earth, so naturally she brought it with her to space. The crew splashed down safely off the coast of Florida in March. It then took 45 days of dedicated rehabilitation to get used to gravity again. Getting to space was a long journey for Nicole Mann. Out of 6,300 people who applied, she was one of eight chosen by NASA. As a child, she was interested in math and science. But it wasn't until later in my career when I was flying jets in the Marine Corps that I realized that being an astronaut was actually something that was achievable. And I think as a young kid, I just didn't realize that opportunity existed. Man has not only broken a glass ceiling, she blasted off out of this world, charting a course for others to follow. Donna Sound, CTV News, Toronto. Some anxious moments today after the U.S. president fell at an Air Force graduation ceremony in Colorado. <laughs> Joe Biden fell on a stage after greeting graduates. He was helped up and taken to his seat to watch the rest of the ceremony. The White House says the 80-year-old is fine. 
and that he tripped on a sandbag used to support a teleprompter. Dr. Jill Biden, meanwhile, was in Jordan today at the massive wedding celebration for the country's heir to the throne. 28-year-old Crown Prince Hussein wed 29-year-old Saudi architect Rajwa Al Saif, whose family has ties to her nation's ruling dynasty. Prince William and Kate were among the many royals from around the world on the guest list. After the ceremony, tens of thousands watched as the couple was escorted to a state banquet. Congratulations to them. After the break, underwater and undercover, the whale believed to be a spy. An international mammal of mystery was spotted off the coast of Sweden this week. A whale, once allegedly used by Russia as a spy. CTV's Richard Madden went to Washington's International Spy Museum to put this in perspective. Swimming his way across Scandinavian waters, that so-called Russian spy whale is on the move. So he's in Sweden as we are speaking right now. Uh, he seems to be trending south still, but if he keeps on this path, he'll be in Denmark pretty soon. Hey, 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 hey. The beluga was first spotted off the coast of Norway four years ago, wearing a camera strapped to a custom harness stamped Equipment St. Petersburg. He's nicknamed Havladimir, a combination of the Norwegian word for whale and Russian President Vladimir Putin. All signs point to the fact that he was in a Russian military program. Of course, Russia isn't the only country that trains animals for espionage. The CIA famously launched Project Acoustic Kitty during the Cold War, implementing surveillance gear into a house cat to spy on targets. So they think, what if we get a cat and use that to gather intelligence? So they put a speaker in its ear, a receiver in the base of its skull, and they try to train the cat and go places they want it to go. You can't really train a cat, though. This is the old saying, I have a couple myself, it's very, very difficult. So ultimately it was unsuccessful. From using carrier pigeons to transmit messages during the First World War, to robotic snakes used as surveillance in the Gulf War. But Havladimir's style isn't covert, it's friendly. A local celebrity along his travels, performing tricks on demand for a price. And that's become a big problem. He's displaced, he's out of habitat, he now relies on humans for social interaction. It has been dangerous. He's been hit by boats multiple times. He's had fishing hooks caught in him. Advocacy group One Whale hopes to create a sanctuary off Norway's coast to rehabilitate and ease of Vladimir into a well-deserved retirement after a life of mystery and possible espionage. Richard Madden, CTV News, Washington. And that's a snapshot of this Thursday. Heather Butts will be here tomorrow. For all of us at CTV National News, thank you for watching. And good night.